Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Finally, I'm turning the tables and using technology against one of the pioneers of all the technology that we know and love. And it's none other than Dr. Andrew Andy Viterbi, who is a hero of mine. And it's such a great treat to be, uh, to be with you today. Andy, thanks for spending some time with us on this podcast uh, from, from my house, at the, uh, from my office at UCSD to wherever you may be. Thank you for joining us. Hope I don't disappoint you. <laughs> no, nah, we did that it, kind I, of introduction. <laughs> I haven't given your proper introduction yet. I'll do it now. Uh, Andy Viterbi <clears throat> uh, was born. Uh, <clears throat> he was born uh, in. You were born Andrea Giacomo Viterbi. I think Bergamo. I'm saying that. Yeah, it's become famous now. <laughs> in Bergamo. For, for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, and you are an, an American electrical engineer and businessman who co-founded Qualcomm and invented the Viterbi algorithm. He has been the presidential chair professor of electrical engineering at USC's Viterbi School of Engineering. And uh, we're talking today about your career and especially about this book. This book I'm holding up. Yes, I'm holding up the front cover. Normally, I, Andy, I say I judge books by their covers. Uh, and, but I'm not going to judge this book by its cover. How did this book come about? The book is called Reflections of an Educator, Researcher, and Entrepreneur. And you and I spoke about this at a synagogue in San Diego about four, three or four years ago. And uh, it was a packed house. And people are just so curious about your life and what uh, the wisdom that you can uh, provide. But how did you come to write this particular book? It's, it's not like your, your textbook, is it? No, not at all. <laughs> Although I have uh, a little bit of... Uh... Uh, watered down explanation of the algorithm, which uh, <laughs> probably more confuses than it explains. <laughs> but uh, I did it uh, in a moment of uh, some sadness, but uh, something I wanted to leave to my grandchildren. And my children, although I point out that uh, my children had lived through, lived and suffered through a certain part of, a fair, fair part of the uh, narrative. Um, I, uh, so that was the original and I, I actually uh, bound or had bound some, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 copies gave to all my children, my grandchildren, that's about half of them, and the other half to friends uh, and, and close acquaintances. Um, this, um, at, at, uh, for some years now, I've been involved with a, uh, a society in New York City, which uh, runs on a shoestring for a, a very small audience in the United States, maybe a slightly larger one in Italy, uh, uh, regarding Italian Jews. And they have... Uh, in association with NYU, Columbia, and uh, CUNY, uh, they put on a number of lectures uh, by American and Italian scholars and historians and uh, uh, other uh, specialties. Um, now, recently, they've been doing uh, Zoom uh, webinars which uh, go much further afield than New York City. And uh, uh, recently did one on the uh, Sephardic Jews of, uh, um, of uh, Salonika, which was a, it's a very interesting uh, um, subject that uh, based on one family whose archives had been held a very large, broad Sephardic family of many, uh, many um, uh, branches uh, from about the uh, beginning of the 19th century uh, through the uh, Holocaust and thereafter. In any case, um, that's just one example of what the, uh, the kinds of studies they uh, uh, put on. And uh, the, uh, they also have a book series, 
And so uh, the uh, the editor, who's also the uh, uh, assistant director of the uh, Primo Levi Center, this uh, organization that I referred to earlier, um, asked me if if uh, he could publish this uh, handbook, which I'd given or memoir, which I'd given him. And I said, sure, why not? And he did a very good job on it and uh, made me uh, improve a couple of sections. So we were last together last year. It was 2019. It was the 100th anniversary of the birth of Primo Levi. And we did a symposium here with some renowned chemists and and other people. Uh, I also pointed out it was the uh, 150th anniversary last year of the periodic table, which is behind my back over here, which is the title of one of Primo's famous, most famous uh, essays. And you're related to Primo. Can you explain the relationship? And what was Primo like as a, as a person and as a scientist? Well, I'm a first cousin-in-law. <laughs> uh, that is uh, his wife or his late wife there. Unfortunately, that generation, my generation, although I'm the youngest member thereof, but uh, most of my cousins, uh, my first cousins have passed on. I have no uh, siblings. So um, uh, um, oh yeah, so uh, his, uh, his wife is my first cousin. Mm. Uh, the daughter of a distinguished uh, um, family in education and literature. Her father was a uh, a published author of, uh, uh, a lot, he was a, uh, what we call high school, they call lyceum. He was a lyceum professor and uh, fairly renowned. But um, but uh, the Levy family, I would say the, the first really famous member was Primo. Uh, he, in his, uh, um, periodic table, periodic, uh, in English, it's periodic table, in Italian, it's different. Um, he uh, describes his ancestors in in the Piedmont region of uh, Italy, and uh, he's not very nice to them. <laughs> he also uncovers the, the uh, um, dialect the, well, let's say, the, the Yiddish of Piedmont, which was never spoken by more than maybe 2,000 people, <laughs> but uh, uh, ranks up there with uh, Ladino and Yiddish. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't aware that there was another, another dialect. I guess we don't, we don't lack for, di uh, for dialects uh, in our particular culture. Um, when we when we look at your this biography again, it's called um, Re Reflections of an Educator, Researcher, and Entrepreneur from the CPL Editions Memoirs and Biography Series. You have many chapters here. Let us start with um, with the fact that you came here as a refugee and you went on to achieve these incredible heights of success academically, as a business person, entrepreneurially, uh, and then later philanthropically. What do you, if, if some alien, you know, gets a broadcast, you know, and can decode CDMA and the Viterbi algorithm, and they say, Andy, who are you? What is the core essence of who you are? How would you answer it? What sums up who, how you think about who Andrew Viterbi is? Well, I was a very fortunate man. I was a very fortunate child and grew into uh, a man who, was, seemed to be in the right place or in the right uh, um, field at the right time. Um, as a child, uh, if I were to compare myself to other children of that era, they were born in Bergamo, I was very lucky in that uh, my parents, first of all, uh, found a way to uh, enter America, uh, where if they had stayed, we, we would have uh, met this, the fate of uh, one of the, my father's closest friends, the uh, psychiatrist, uh, 
um, Giuseppe Muggia, who um, was originally from Venice. And uh, when the racial laws that took away all civil rights from Jews enforced in 1938, uh, he decided just to move back to, to Venice because that was his home, his, his origin. He knew everybody there and they were all his friends. And in 1943, he, his wife and his daughter uh, wound up in uh, a cattle car on its way to uh, Auschwitz. Um, so my father had the foresight to find, uh, to seek an exit. And uh, he had, it wasn't easy. We did it through Switzerland, through a close colleague and friend in Switzerland who was able to pull strings with the U.S. consul in uh, Zurich, whereas the uh, U.S. consul in Naples, where the uh, embassy was in, uh, well, the embassy was in Rome, but the main consulate was in Naples, rejected uh, his request for a, uh, an exit visa, well, for an American visa. And um, so we made it uh, three days before the war broke out in uh, Poland, uh, August 27th of 1939. Uh, in that period, uh, public education for children was uh, in New York and Boston were excellent. And I had a good <laughs> introduction to English after my poor exasperated teacher who couldn't communicate with me kept putting me in the corner. <laughs> and uh, then we moved to Boston because again, to my good fortune, my father uh, passed the license, the medical licensing exam in Massachusetts. And I was able to uh, be educated in the Boston public schools at that time, which were very good. And uh, some of them are still good. My high school alma mater, Boston Latin, is considered the best in the state, possibly of public schools, because there's a lot of preparatory schools. It was a, actually a public preparatory school, six years, and uh, uh, ranked as well or higher than the uh, private schools in, in the area. Uh, so anyway, I came out of there and was easily admitted to MIT, uh, went into the right field, uh, electronics, electrical engineering at the time when uh, 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 the time was ripe. Um, MIT was on the, on the leading edge, partly because of the radiation lab that had been uh, located there during World War II mostly developing radar, but also communications, and uh, learned what was the advanced electronics, advanced uh, electrical and electronics theory of the 50s, which is laughable by today's standards. But uh, kept with it, computer science, computer wasn't even a science, wasn't even considered a department took a couple of rudimentary courses in, in uh, computers and uh, also uh, did a co-op program, which had been active at MIT for uh, most of the 20th century. You talk a lot about luck in your autobiography, luck to escape, as you just said, the uh, the devastation of, of World War II and the Holocaust, um, being able to come to America and go to uh, the, the schools that you were educated at, uh, and then later, yes, to go to the JPL and the time when when uh, the U.S. space program was really ramping up for the first time, and really Southern California. What was it like? I'm, I've always been curious. What was the spirit? What was kind of the the zeitgeist like back then in terms of entrepreneurship, creativity? Is this, is this something that was in the air? And do you think feel like it's something that can have a renaissance maybe even nowadays? Well, in the 50s, Cold War competition with the Soviets 
And of course, Sputnik was a wake up call, uh, both uh, for our government and also for science, because they started to pour money in. That was the only way that science could really be pushed forward because entrepreneurship was not in the zeitgeist. Um, there were excellent uh, organizations that were not military primarily. Uh, Bell Labs is particularly the one that's recognized, but so was IBM, so was General Electric at that time. Uh, throughout the Cold War, that continued. And uh, entrepreneurship really started, in my recollection, probably in the 70s and then got a very big boost throughout the rest of the century. And the companies that I was with or helped found uh, initially uh, were very dependent on government funding. Luckily, it was a funding uh, non-lethal <laughs> for non-lethal devices, namely uh, communication um, security devices that is anti-jam and uh, um, anti-detection. Uh, and uh, so that the very same technology, which generally is called spread spectrum, the person most accredited uh, for its initial, initialization was Hedy Lamar. Most of that story is true. It's a little bit embellished, but, um, um, in any case, by the 50s, uh, it was well ingrained into the uh, uh, military communications world. And uh, we, it was uh, talking about entrepreneurial um, activities in the commercial world. We were probably the first to, to, to use it successfully initially for uh, transportation, for uh, satellite communication to trucks, uh, and then later uh, to uh, what is called CDMA, Code Division Multiple Access, uh, which is one of the spread spectrum technologies that are now used throughout 3G, 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G. 4G was a uh, real breakthrough because that's how uh, the cell phone was connected to the internet. How, how did you realize or how did you move from something that was academic, uh, scientific or, or engineering and, and signals and systems? How did you realize that that could have actual commercial value? Or did you even, because this was decades before it was really fully put into use, if I'm not mistaken. No, uh, it, we transitioned seamlessly. Three professors, two at UCLA at the time and one at UCSD, Erwin Jacobs, got together uh, after a NASA uh, conference in the Bay Area in 1967. It took us a while to figure out how to found a company. It took about a year for us to convince ourselves that it could be done, it, it was worth doing. And then we got some small contracts initially from what was then called the Naval Electronics Lab. It's now gone through several names, Spa Wars and other things like that. It's still in San Diego. They gave us our first little contract for probably $20,000, $30,000. And we were able to hire another engineer. <laughs> so now we were four. Uh, one of the three founders, I got very involved in uh, ARPANET, the predecessor of the internet, and effectively dropped out. We left him some of the uh, worthless stock at the time. A dozen years later, it was worth something. And then uh, Irwin came on full time because we were just working one day a week, except for the, uh, the uh, engineer, uh, Jerry Heller, who was the first guy to show that the Viterbi algorithm 
uh, was feasible and was easier to implement than most people believed. In any case, uh, we used that as a vehicle and uh, did work for, as I said, the Navy and then also for JPL as they were uh, implementing uh, their space missions to uh, uh, the moon and, well, that was a little later, but uh, all their uh, planetary missions, unmanned planetary missions. We were never really at a loss because we were uh, doing government contracts, which were had um, uh, progress payments. But uh, by 1980, we were already uh, what we thought was a big company. We went from three people to about uh, several, maybe 300. And uh, we had turned down a couple of offers from aerospace corporation uh, companies like Lockheed. And then along came a small conglomerate based in Boston uh, that was picking up all these little startups, uh, most of which ultimately uh, <laughs> collapsed. But uh, we were successful for them. And one of the uh, more important products was to do a digital television system for uh, uh, HBO, mm -hmm. home box office, uh, which uh, uh, was a little uh, concerned that their signal was being stolen. And so we, we built them a, uh, a secure digital system. Uh, and uh, that really boosted the company, actually, to some extent, boosted the parent company. And uh, um, but eventually the parent company had a um, palace revolution, ousted the CEO um, chairman who had acquired our company and the company started to uh, rapidly descend uh, to uh, a shadow of uh, what it had been. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, management was not very successful and they remanaged us out of, uh, well, without going into any detail, it was no longer fun. And so Erwin and I quit and uh, three months later started Qualcomm. And Qualcomm, uh, well, we started it with a number of our original leading engineers. And uh, so to some extent we had a running start, although um, we didn't have very much money. And well, we, had, we were able to uh, sell finance for, for a while. Then we got some study contracts from uh, defense contractors initially. In fact, it, the uh, the um, Leo, the low Earth orbiting satellites, uh, were initiated by uh, based on one of our study contracts, which then led to Global Star, which was a great technical achievement but a uh, commercial failure, along with all the others. By the way. <laughs> I want to talk about non-commercial failures in terms of the marketplace, but maybe a financial mistake that you might have made, which was not to patent the Viterbi algorithm. Um, was that a mistake in retrospect? Uh, you talked about it in a 1999 interview as not really regretting it, but but I wonder, you know, looking back in hindsight, this is now being used by people, you know, for their own commercial purposes. Why shouldn't you know Andy have gotten more of a a taste of the of the intellectual fruits that you had picked. Well, to begin with, if it had been patented, it would have been patented in 1968 <laughs> uh, when we first presented it to uh, a, uh, a patent attorney. Mm. Told us this will never be <laughs> used by any anybody but governments. It's much too expensive and too complicated. And he was right. It took about a decade before it, and probably closer to two decades before it became com commercially valuable. Mm. Uh, meanwhile, you know, uh, the industry proceeded. We were able to finally 
in the late 70s put it on a single chip. And, uh, uh, and, and to some extent, it probably gained um, attention and ground because it was unpatented. And, uh, and therefore, it got into uh, several generations. As far as I know, it's still in the current generation. I've been away from it for a couple of decades, so I don't follow G 5G other than what I, the advertisements I see in, uh, on television, which is all hype anyway. <laughs> yeah, which you can't avoid. And, and that's another question I have. You know, I've heard about 4G and 3G and LTE and all these things that are going to revolutionize. And I had on Peter Diamandis, who, like you, is an MIT alum. He writes all these books about, you know, the future is going to be bold and abundant because of things like 5G. Uh, but I, I seem to remember him saying the same thing maybe about 4G and 3G. Uh, and so my, my question is, is it really worth the hype? The, these, you know, can something like 5G really revolutionize the world as you see it? Good question. Every G co uh, corresponds to one decade. And why one decade? Because more players come into it and they want the, the, their own thing. Uh, but there certainly have been great progress. I had the good fortune of helping to develop 2G CDMA. It was a struggle to get uh, CDMA into 2G because uh, the world had already decided on a different technology, a much more conventional technology, and the Europeans had run with it. It's called uh, GSM. The name actually started from a French, the French uh, um, title of the working group that put it together, Group Special Mobile. We were uh, struggling to be accepted in that 2G, and uh, we were boosted by other uh, early uh, cellular companies into air touch and now it's called Verizon but Verizon is uh, you know half the uh, users in the country and they were the one all of these variously named uh, evolutions uh, used our technology CDMA but and uh, what really boosted it was uh, the Korean market the Koreans uh, adopted it as their sole digital technology Ex, uh, rejecting both GSM and the, and the Japanese version. And in my opinion, that's what really boosted uh, Samsung and other companies in Korea uh, from secondary to uh, primary status in the industry. 3G was our great success because that's where uh, the whole world accepted it. After suing us left and right, we were uh, attacked by Ericsson and Nokia, who were the European leaders, by Motorola, but we, we settled with everybody favorably. At the end of the uh, uh, 90s, I turned 65 and I retired. I'd had my fun. However, uh, a very small company that was an offshoot from Bell Labs came and asked me to join their board and be on their advisory committee. And they were the ones who really um, boosted the next technology, 4G, and had the foresight to design it in a way that it was particularly uh, adapt, adapted for the internet by uh, uh, minimizing the lag times, uh, which are, are so disturbing. Uh, so I had the very good fortune to be part of that. It wasn't nearly the <laughs> financial success that Qualcomm had been, but it was a very satisfying uh, role to be kind of a uh, uh, godfather <laughs> to that one. It's called Flareon, by the way. It was bought by Qualcomm, to which I give my <laughs> colleagues uh, Credit. Then uh, 5G started in uh, the 2010s. As I said, it it, it had to. It, 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 all these things are always under development. 
starting at least five years prior to the decade, but the first uh, tentative uh, implementations are uh, put out in, uh, in in the zero uh, year, 20, 2000, 2010, 2020. Um, I, I won't go into the details of 2020 because it's only what I read in the papers. <laughs> uh, but it, it exploits a, a very um, high frequency band and uh, it uh, therefore uses a small antenna, but it has fairly low range, so you have to have very many, which applies very well for cities, but not so well for rural areas. Yeah. So that's all you know. Okay. So I, I had the good luck of spending most of my career in an industry that was growing faster than anything else in any <laughs> previous industry. Another example of luck <clears throat> triumphing. Um, I want to ask you a little bit more about commercialization, but maybe not in the way that we were just talking about it. Uh, and that's to say the value of basic research in science and engineering, theoretical research, and, and even you know basic research like I do in cosmology, which, as you know, the cosmic microwave background radiation that I study uh, was really discovered at Bell Laboratories, which you know, exists and you can go and visit the, you know, the seven meter horn antenna there in Homedale. And I know you've had a lot of interaction with Bell Laboratories and we'll, we'll talk about that maybe later, but what I want, and, and then subsequently Bell Labs went on, I believe to invent one of the first cell phones and, and, uh, and, 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 and many other patents and, and so forth, but really wasn't able to survive as a, um, you know, non-commercial pure research based facility and now is owned by Nokia. And they still call it Bell Labs, but that's just for historical, uh, you know, attribution, I suppose. But, you know, I've of often heard things decrying how poor the funding is in basic mathematics, in basic science, that is science without a profit or engineering motive. And yet we always want our kids and our grandkids, et cetera, to go into STEM fields. Uh, and so I'm wondering, is there a way, have you thought of a way that we could use the, you know, kind of inventions that come out of basic research, like the Turby algorithm enabling CDMA and enabling um, very high performance uh, mobile communications. Can we use that to generate, uh, not I don't want to say wealth or income, but to generate resources, financial resources for theoretical physicists and cosmologists and, and mathematicians to benefit from so that this virtuous cycle can continue? I mean, coming out of industry rather than from government. Maybe both. I mean, the government, you know, uh, has is not the only, you know, kind of uh, supplier of research funding, but they sure do benefit tremendously. They benefited from CDMA. They benefited from the Viterbi algorithm and you didn't uh, patent it so they could do whatever they want. But uh, but they don't seem to feed that back into basic. That is, you know, uh, what what Nobel laureate Sheldon Glashow called on my program, useless research. <laughs> you know, the fundamental particles of nature aren't going to speed up our Internet. But I think it's part of what drives us as human beings. So is there a way we can commercialize, you know, utilize the commercial uh, benefits of email, you know, attacks on every email? You guys used to own Eudora. That was one of your products, if I remember correctly, which I used for a long time. Uh, what about taxing each email and then funneling some of that money back into mathematics? Crazy idea. But what do you think about ways to, to utilize the, the intellectual property uh, to benefit basic research? Well, it's a, it's a good idea. It uh, probably can't be done. Uh, let me just pick up on some of the things you said. Yes, Bell Labs, uh, uh, Bell Labs today is not what it was. Okay? But when Judge Green broke up AT&T, he, uh, he significantly demolished, degraded the value of the, of their, of the uh, jewel of the uh, AT&T system. Uh, and then AT&T ultimately <laughs> was grabbed by the most aggressive of the baby bells. But uh, they had a, quite a run. Uh, all of, well, many fields, including the ones I've been most interested in, really got their start at Bell Labs. Uh, you were talking about uh, 
uh, radio astronomy. Uh, and you will know that Arno Penzias, uh, he was very lucky where you were not. <laughs> and he got the Nobel Prize. Interestingly, a Bell Lab scientist who I knew well has passed on fairly young, actually, told me that he didn't understand the first thing about information theory, mm -hmm. that he had been, uh, uh, since Arno was the vice president of research, I think, uh, my friend uh, had uh, briefed him a number of times on uh, what was called the math lab or the mathematical uh, uh, applications lab, and uh, didn't didn't get his message through very well. Yeah. But uh, Bell Labs is, uh, was, was a unique uh, organization. Uh, the problem is for the uh, corporations, even the largest ones, I would give uh, Microsoft a little more credit than the others. I've heard uh, Bill Gates talk about uh, how their research labs and the people he has in them. Uh, I, Google has some very smart guys and gals, uh, but I'm not sure that they have the same uh, interest in, in science. They may. They certainly started out with some uh, good applied mathematicians launching it, uh, uh, Page and, and Brin. Uh, but uh, certainly the smaller companies, and I, among them I would include uh, uh, um, uh, Qualcomm, have the uh, disadvantage of having shareholders. <laughs> and uh, they won't look beyond uh, the next fiscal year. And so that's the problem with uh, industry. The problem with government is, the, is greed and ignorance in Congress and the president. Now, we may improve on that. <laughs> uh, I made some comments towards the end of the memoir about capitalism and socialism. Uh, I know it's a dirty word. It isn't to me, but uh, it is. Uh, people seem to get scared by it. But as long as it's, it remains a democracy and is reasonably well governed, as as is the case in much of Western Europe, uh, the UK still, Germany, France. Uh, it, it works. They all have better, more efficient health systems than we do, even though, in fact, well, uh, we, but, but our scientists are still, as, uh, still the best in the world for a simple reason. They attract people from they attract the best of the, the uh, cream of the crop from all over, from Asia, from Europe, from uh, Africa. But um, <laughs> hopefully we can get back to that uh, way of doing things. And we've certainly lost our, a lot of uh, respect in, in the last four years. Do you think that, you know, actually literally applying a tax or, you know, um, Physicists played a huge role in the invention of and uh, DARPA, et cetera, in the invention of uh, of you know email and HTTP proto FTP protocols, and also obviously the World Wide Web at CERN was invented at CERN to a large extent. Uh, but would would it not impede progress to say have some kind of a tax? I mean, do you think there'd be less creativity had had or less development? Let's say you would you did patent it, um, and you made you know it, the the they did pay for it. The government would have paid for it. It was a small amount of money to them. Uh, would that have impeded? Like, will we only be on two G now? Uh, in other words, does does monetizing via like taxation does that ultimately impede progress? Well, in my opinion, and it's strictly my opinion, <laughs> debatable. Uh, I believe that as long as we were in a uh, existential uh, struggle with uh, Eastern Europe, with, with Russia, with the Soviet Union, uh, we poured a lot of money into, uh, into 
research, uh, a lot of it wasted, uh, but we did great things in space and aeronautics, and even more important uh, in uh, communication, tying together for better and sometimes for worse, our nation and the world. Uh, with the end of the Cold War, we mu much curtailed that. Uh, industry, or private enterprise more likely, more properly, uh, was, uh, is a great uh, um, creator because it incentivizes people incentivizes mostly for, uh, for wealth, but also in the technological fields, and that includes, of course, all the biological fields, it also incentivizes people to, to do things that are, have never been done before, uh, independent of whether they're uh, profitable or not. And you get better people doing that. Uh, not that I mean, not that in the Cold War we didn't have very good people, but uh, as as that whole project wound down, the people that are attracted to government work are not quite the same level. The ones who are more are either. Uh, in it for science and culture and stay at universities or else they uh, they go to industry and and try to make the, the best of products so it's a balancing act uh, are we and and and, and it's a, a pendulum that swings between creativity and uh, inaction Absolutely. Okay. Well, we've got a few more uh, minutes left and I have a few more questions, so it should work out pretty well. I want to ask you, you may have heard recently of the uh, possible detection of a techno signature, which is to say a carrier wave signal coming from a, uh, a star system known as Proxima Centauri B. And Proxima Centauri, Proxima means, as you know, from your Latin upbringing uh, with the Romance language, uh, means nearest. So, so Proxima Centauri is our nearest celestial neighbor. And it seems as if there's a, a roughly one gigahertz uh, tone coming from that particular direction, that particular star system, only about four light years away. And that has been uh, claimed by a team called the Breakthrough um, listen, listen, meaning like ear, listen, a program up at UC Berkeley. I've got many friends that work up there and uh, loosely affiliated with, uh, with the Allen telescope array, which is funded in part by Franklin Antonio, who is one of your uh, friends and, and co, uh, co collaborators and, and, and link a bit and Qualcomm, et cetera. Uh, but we've detected apparently some signal. I talked to a, 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 a scientist about this recently, Jill Tarter, who is the inspiration for the character that in, in uh, Carl Sagan's contact movie, Ellie Arroway. But anyway, what do you make about this? What, do you think uh, that extraterrestrials exist, first of all, Andy? And second of all, uh, would they? How, how would you communicate? How would you tell the Proximans, you know, what would you tell them about, about us and how would you do so? Well, they, uh, there's been a program to look, to try to find extraterrestrials for at least 60 years. It was called the CETI. I don't yes. recall now what the acronym uh, stood for, but uh, it was started at Stanford in their uh, antenna farm. In fact, I was invited to that to participate, but I had just gotten to UCLA and uh, just- Was that with Bracewell? Out. Was that with Bracewell or? Uh, was that uh, was it was that with uh, Professor Bracewell at Stanford or who? who I was think that's there? right. Yes, yeah. and uh, in fact, my younger colleague uh, Jim Omura worked uh, there for quite a number of years uh, while still be, being at UC at UCLA. Um, so uh, 
yes, uh, it's worth doing. Uh, Franklin is a very inter intelligent and very interesting fellow. Uh, whether it, well, uh, should I put odds on it? <laughs> 10 to the minus six. <laughs> and that's being generous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I tend to there agree. There is also uh, what was it called? I, the uh, the survey that looked for planets that had yeah. similar characteristics to the Earth. Yeah, there's a bunch of surveys. One is called Kepler. One is called TESS. These are uh, these are uh, surveys in space that are looking for either the dimming of a planet by a star, by a uh, dimming of by of a star by a planet. Uh, transit or uh, perturbations to its orbit. And we've detected thousands of planets, some even Earth-like, very Earth-like planets around very sun-like stars. And yet, um, I'm curious, why do you think the probability for the existence of, not not just like a slime mold, but but intelligent, so SETI stands, or CETA, as you say, stands for uh, either communicating with extraterrestrial intelligence or searching for extraterrestrial intelligence, but um, why do you think the odds are so low? Oh, actually, if it's one in a million and there's 10 to the 20th stars, that, that means that there's, you know, it could be a lot. But I assume you mean the overall odds of any technological life is extremely low. Why, why do you feel that way? I mean, the percentage is one in a million? Yeah, if you say one in a million stars, you're talking about literally, you know, a, billion, a million stars in our, in our own galaxy, potentially. Yeah, and it may be approaching infinity, although mathematicians are yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, so, uh, I, I really at a loss and, yeah. and to comment on that. Uh, it's certainly, well, it, with, uh, the kinds of project programs like the, uh, finding the black holes, uh, that won another Nobel prize more for, I guess, administration than for science. <laughs> But uh, uh, that that was so remarkable that you cannot exclude anything from happening. Uh, but uh, you know, given our uh, very limited imagination, talking about myself, but human beings always you know, cook up something that makes sense to them and makes no sense otherwise. Uh, who knows what that uh, that um, other life? If there is other life, who knows what it's like? It's not little green men; <laughs> they don't look like us. <laughs> but yeah. Intelligence. Well, if you can, if you believe in artificial intelligence, uh, not that I believe that we're going to be taken over by cyclops, uh, but um, then uh, anything is possible. <laughs> yeah, I do. Uh, I do always note that I'm still looking for signs of of, of terrestrial intelligence uh, that occupies a lot of my time. Well, Andy, I'm, we're coming to the end. I do want to ask you the questions that I ask all of my honored and treasured guests who do come on the Into the Impossible podcast, which is named after one of uh, Sir Arthur C. Clarke's famous three laws. We'll get to that in a second. Did you ever know Sir Arthur or meet Arthur C. Clarke? Uh, not in person, but I think I was on a call with him through the Marconi Society ah. some years, some decades ago. Very uh, nice. So I, I usually ask my guests, um, hearkening back to the conversation we had at the synagogue not too long ago, um, what they would put in an ethical will. So not a material will, but uh, in Judaism, we have this concept called the Zava'ah, which means ethical will, and it sort of harkens back to what Moses does in the book of Deuteronomy, where he kind of gives all these imprecations and, and threats. <laughs> Very few like uh, blessings seem to come out of it, but uh, but there's sort of uh, a lot of warnings. And I wonder, uh, what would you put in in your ethical will, not your material will, uh, but but something to leave to your children, of which you know uh, you 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 have many and grandchildren, but um, uh, but actually to your ideological children like me, people that look to you as a role model, what would you put out there as inspiration, as wisdom in an ethical will? Well, I actually touch on that briefly in, the, I think, in my preface. 
And uh, what I uh, what I say there is that if you find something that you enjoy, uh, if, if you're so lucky as to actually be turned on by your uh, uh, the choice, the career of choice, and the kinds of of things and projects and books you write or plays you uh, uh, you create uh, or uh, scientific activities, uh, then uh, that's one of the real joys of life. You, mm -hmm. you effectively you're, you're not working a day of your life; you're spending it all having fun. Uh, of that's course, great. there's also family, which brings. Uh, a a higher level of satisfaction uh, if things if you're successful or if you're lucky it's always I always come back to that I married a woman who was extraordinary and uh, much of uh, what my grandchildren my kids and my grandchildren are doing uh, is uh, and the way they're living their lives is a lot of it due to her. And uh, I finished that memoir just before she passed. I had no idea that uh, I wouldn't be able to share it with her. Yeah, yeah, she was a she was a real treasure, not just for for San Diego. I had the, the honor and blessing to meet her several occasions uh, ever since I came here in 2004, and and she was was gracious and and uh, delightful, a, a human being. We miss her terribly too. And uh, we're so glad that, that you have shared your wisdom with us. Uh, I want to continue with that and also connect to uh, Sir Arthur C. Clarke uh, by evoking the memory of a movie called 2001, A Space Odyssey. Did you ever see that, Andy? Uh, some parts of it. I also fall asleep. I, <laughs> <laughs> I do well, that a lot. <laughs> Yeah, the opening scene has these ape-like creatures uh, in Africa, and they yeah. encounter this monolith, this huge black obelisk or whatever it is. We don't know what it is, really, but it's it's really sort of a time capsule placed by an ancient alien civilization to kind I'm of... Still awake. I was still awake to see that. <laughs> yeah, that well, that's the opening credit, so I, I don't give you much credit for staying awake for that, but but I, I don't fault you for falling asleep. I, I think I, I closed my eyes the first time I saw it because I was scared, but anyway... Um, thinking about that, uh, a time capsule, the notion of a time capsule has always been appealing to people throughout history. And actually, I talked to Carl Sagan's widow. Her name is Anne Druyan. And I asked her, what would you put on a, a billion year long time capsule that would last for a billion years? And she said, I did that when the Voyager satellite was launched in uh, in the 70s or 80s, or early 70s. She had her brainwaves recorded by Carl Sagan, who made this golden disc. And it had music and it had all sorts of other things. And that went into the outer reaches of our solar system and is now in interstellar space. Uh, right. I want to ask you, and I think I might know what you might put on it, but what aspect, um, uh, as Richard Feynman, the famous Nobel laureate, said, uh, if in some cataclysm all scientific knowledge was destroyed and only one sentence could be passed on to the next generation of creatures, what statement would contain the most information in the fewest words? And he said, I believe it is the atomic hypothesis that all things are made of atoms. I want to ask you, Andy, what one thing would you most want to put on a monolith to last for a billion years <laughs> that would encapsulate you or what you've learned or the grandeur of, of humankind? Well, quantum mechanics that works, but nobody really understands why. <laughs> Some say that about the Viterbi algorithm, but uh, that's uh, trivial. <laughs> very good. Okay, the last question I ask goes the opposite direction. We've gone into the future with a time capsule and with your ethical will. Um, now I want to ask you backwards. I want to ask you, in terms of advice to your former self, what would you what would you say once seemed impossible to a young 20, 30 year old Andy Viterbi, oh. but now seems eminently feasible because you had the courage to go into the impossible? I guess I would say uh, communicating uh, in real time uh, worldwide. 
Looks like you just got. Sounds like you just got a message from some distant planet on on, on your device over there. <laughs> so that seemed impossible. Well, that makes a lot of sense. It certainly seems magical to me that well, you and I are in the same town, but but I talked to people. I talked to a woman from uh, Egypt not too long ago, and it was just incredible that we could be talking about my book. She's a devout Muslim. I'm a devout uh, Jew, and we could have a conversation instantaneously at the speed of light. And a large part of it is thanks to you. Oh, I can't resist, Andy. I'm sorry. If you have one more minute, you've won a tremendous number of accolades and awards, but I don't want to just focus on that. I want to ask you a question. Um, let me just, let me just uh, get these back. So you've, we've won the following awards and I don't want to talk about the awards, as you know, my feelings about awards, et cetera, but you've won the Alexander Graham Bell prize, the Marconi medal, the Claude Shannon award, the James Clerk Maxwell Medal and the John Fritz Medal, which I don't know much about, but of all those people, of all those people, Maxwell, uh, Shannon, Marconi, Graham Bell, who would you most like to meet to explain the Viterbi algorithm to? Well, uh, first of all, it wouldn't be Shannon because <laughs> he would look at it and say, "That's trivial." It's probably, <laughs> it was clearly in one of my papers. <laughs> he was a very, very timid, very shy individual. Yeah. I don't mean, uh, but uh, uh, but uh, he's uh, uh, no. I would be. Uh, I have met Shannon, and I, I'd be embarrassed. Uh, I would. Uh, I would uh, love to meet uh, James Clark Maxwell. Yeah, right. he pushed. Well, he's a mathematician, basically. A th more of a theorist than a, than a practical. Uh, uh, Hertz, um, Heinrich Hertz had done the, the experiment, but he didn't understand A, why, and B, that it would ever be practical. He said that specifically. Yeah. Uh, no, James Clark Maxwell really, and it wasn't just uh, uh, electromagnetics. He did a lot of other things. And uh, I think he was the greatest scientist of the 19th century. 20th century, you've got you've got a lot of con candidates. Einstein, of course, but uh, Feynman and, uh, and and many others, and Shannon. Did you overlap with Feynman when you were in Caltech or JPL? He he was oh he was at Caltech. I was just working at the laboratory, and uh, um, but one of my closest friends, Saul Galum, was very close. Oh, yeah. to him. So it's uh, a uh, one number, what do you call it? One one uh, step away. Like the Erdos, uh, one degree of separation, right? Separation. <laughs> well, Andy, I want to thank you so much. Uh, you're really a legend and you're one of my heroes. I, I love talking to you because you're not only a phenomenal scientist, you are, um, you're a philanthropist and you're an incredible father, grandfather, maybe great grandfather, I don't know. Thank um, you, you have too many compliments, but thank you very much. And, uh, I, and uh, I will say that you handle it very well because I was a little bit, uh, I won't say I was worried, but I was a little uncertain uh, of doing this because I have trouble with words as you probably have noticed. I can't remember words and even terms that I used to know very well. And that's something that's happening in my brain, but I'm carrying on nevertheless. I'm, <laughs> I'm not as creative, but I still enjoy uh, mathematics. Well, uh, I, but, I uh, and you handle it well. Thank well, you. Well, I just love talking to you. I love doing events with you. We've done, this is our third event together. Maybe we'll go on the road in 2021 <laughs> and uh, do some stadium stadium yeah. tours, maybe at Qual the old Qualcomm Stadium. Andy, have a blessed uh, 2021. Uh, we, we send my best to, to your, your children and your grandchildren, and I hope that we can meet again, maybe in person, in 2021. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. 